How many of you, is this your first Sunday service out of your jammies? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yay! <laughs> well, thank you for coming. And yeah, don't you love this setup? It's so welcoming. We weren't sure how it was going to work, but I really, I really am enjoying it. So thank you. We're going to have another service at 11. So we will just continue to do this until this is behind us and we can move forward. You know, I've really been thinking and, and discussing with other ministers about these times we're in and what in the world is going on. This has been um, perhaps the most challenging time in, in my lifetime, perhaps that many of us will ever go through. And it's caused us to rethink the way we do everything. And I always like to look for the opportunities we're given in times of challenge. And I lean on the great spiritual leaders that faced similar challenges, if not worse. And their teachings, their tools, help keep us grounded and moving forward. Today I'm donning the Hindu robe for Navaratri, that is that 10 day period of, it's a lot like the Jewish days of awe leading up to the Yom Kippur, the new year. But with the Hindu, they go through a nine day period of three cycles. The first cycle, which is the Durga, and that is the goddess that represents the destruction of evil. And they celebrate this time not so much as, as evil outside somewhere lurking, but of those dark thoughts that we're holding in our hearts. And that first period, that Durga and the goddess of Durga, they call on that, that inner beauty, that goddess, to release from our hearts any anger, any fear, any resentment, any unforgiveness we might be holding. I think that's a beautiful cleansing process, similar to leading up to Easter through Lent. It's, it's so beautiful how we're so much more similar than we are different. But I have put a piece of paper on the table with a pen. Feel free during the service if you would like to release anything that you're holding that may block you from the rest of the process of this holy time. The next goddess that is brought forward in the next three days of the cycle is Lakshima. You may know of Lakshima. If you have Hindu friends, Lakshima would probably be one of the statuettes on their prayer altar. Lakshima is the goddess of wealth and abundance, and not necessarily material wealth, for the Hindu practitioners know that wealth starts within, as an abundance of benevolence, a bene a, an abundance of compassion, an abundance of kindness, of noble works and noble service. So once they have cleansed any darkness from their hearts and minds and energy fields, then they go in to work on this abundance of kindness and compassion. What better time on our planet do we need this nine days of grace than right now? And that third part is Sanswati, the goddess that represents the knowledge of God, the mind of God. Once we have risen above our own selfishness and darkness and fear and anger and feelings of lack, we can begin to understand a higher kingdom, a higher realm that goes beyond human knowledge. So these next 10 days, I invite you to take time to write down that which no longer serves you. What are you holding in your heart that's really blocking you from experiencing your highest nobility? Feel free to write that down if you'd like today. If not, do this practice at home with me. I'm going to make sure that these all get burned on my incense altar and then covered with bright, beautiful flowers. If we were in India and people were out in the streets, they're not. But usually this time of the year, there are literally millions of people around the globe having parades and parties, chanting lots of music and flowers, bright colors to celebrate these nine days of freedom, of getting away from the garbage of the world 
and of celebrating the goddesses, that feminine aspect of God that is so needed in the world right now, where we need loving compassion. And then that 10th day is completion. It started last night as I lit my candle and I began to think, what will we look like on that 10th day when we have in our hearts only compassion left? What will we see? And so these gatherings that we're going to be having, these small sacred gatherings, I'm going to be calling on you. I'm not going to start today. I'm not going to take you by surprise necessarily. But I want to hear this core group, this family, this unity of Ocala family. How are we going to reach the needs of this community? Who are we? Who do we say we are? Who does God say we are? I went back through the archives and I found just a little list of the legacy in which we stand and what the Fillmores were going through. And I've shared with you a little bit about their journey, but I think it's really important right now for all unity to have to stay on my marker so I don't go out of the camera view. <laughs> She's keeping me. I tend to wander. <laughs> You know, I think about our founders and what they were able to accomplish at the time in history that they began the Unity Movement. It is extraordinary what they did. It began with Myrtle's healing, which was a miracle of its own. And their dedication to the workings of spirit and their understanding of a benevolent God. And Jesus is a way shower, an example of someone who embodied the fullness of God. And that legacy is being carried on around the globe by centers just like ours. And they didn't lay down in their challenges at the time. And they were faced with this, this, I'm gonna read some things that they accomplished from their beginning in 1895, 96, 97. Think of that, the 1890s, think, think of what they didn't have, electricity, inside toilets, <laughs> no technology, no automation, and what they accomplished while enduring the Spanish flu <laughs> and other illnesses that there were no vaccines for yet, the Great Depression, massive unemployment, a complete economic crisis and collapse. Deep despair, people were starving in the streets and they carried on. World wars, they carried on. This is some of the things they accomplished in that 30, 40 year span at a time that had nothing that we have right now. Silent Unity was created from a silent society in Merle and Charles living room where they met every evening at seven o'clock to hold the high watch for the planet. Myrtle taught this method of prayer that every one of your chaplains know about how to go in and vision and affirm and see it done and let the goodness of God come through us. They built Silent Unity, which now serves millions and millions of people around the globe. It was started with letter writing. Their writings became so popular in the little newspaper that was circulated, they started their own weekly journal. And from that daily word, Silent Unity, We Wisdom, Unity School of Progressive Christianity and Seminary, a retreat center for ministers all over the world to come and share the diversity and the glory of that diversity, a publishing company that they built in the tunnels the, the tornado tunnels at the village and has their printing presses to this day. They built the Plaza Temple as the Depression began. <laughs> Does that inspire you? Oh my goodness, it goes on and on and on. Schools, the radio, the first radio station in the Kansas City area on Unity Grounds. Charles Fillmore went and said, I'm bringing radio. We're gonna find out what this thing is and what it does and we're gonna blast it out. And the teachers that they produced through that time, 
And look where we are now. We're in what, 125, 30 countries? That many languages? It's outstanding. Why? Why, was, why were they growing by leaps and bounds at a time when the rest of the world was so desperate? What was happening? I know, people were hungry. They were hurting. They needed a beacon of hope, of light, of joy, of a future that could be bright, brighter for my children than it is for me. That's what they offered. This is an opportunity to help millions of people. Right now, people are hurting. People are dying. It is devastating. And we're not going to pretend that's not happening. We are unity, yes, and affirming the good, but we know this has to move forward and we need to do what we do to inspire others to go within and find the very best that they are. I'm so excited because this gives us an opportunity to not only see who we are and come fully into us, but show the world who we are. I'm tired of being the best kept secret on the planet. The world needs us. And so these next few weeks and days, I'm encouraging us to do what we do best, collective consciousness where two or more are gathered, to hold the highest vision for the world, to see, to be the change we want to be so that we can see the change. Who do we want for leaders? What do we want to see in our schools, in our businesses? This is an opportunity to co-create with other organizations that are ready to recover and do things better and do things brighter and bring a collective spirit. It was so easy to jump on that unity bus with the Fillmore's because they were real. What they have worked, these tools are eternal and they're taught in all religions. And it's time we come together and reach out to other organizations that are ready. So I wanted to end this time first with two scriptures that kind of sum up this whole holiday for the Hindu people and how to go in and be ready for the benevolence within us. And then to begin our work that we do so well, which is meditation. This is gonna be more of a Hindu type of meditation to go in and call that benevolence up, to call that compassion up, and to see in those that lead us, in the educators, the medical arenas, the technology. We got this. We have geniuses on this planet. Look at what's been done from the day of the Fillmore's to now. We got this. So two scriptures that are wonderful examples, I think, of these next 10 days to completion is John 13, 34. This was said by Jesus to his disciples at the Seder that was to be his last <laughs> here. I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you and that you love one another. A new commandment, that you love each other. As I have loved you, so simple. We can do that. We can do that. There are no accidents. You are here by divine appointment. And First John, which follows John, <laughs> and it's in chapter 3 oh I love this chapter 3 verse 17 and 18 how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help that was Jesus' entire ministry that is what this holiday of Navaratri is about Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure 
our heart, our hearts before God. That's all God asks, is our love and benevolence. So let's prepare for a time of meditation.